Neil Kaku, a warm welcome to Hard Talk Extra. Glad to be on the show. Now, you ponder, and let's start with the easy question first, the end of the world, the end of the universe, and so on. How do you know about the end of the universe? Well, we have a satellite in outer space, a WMAP. It has forced us to rewrite all the textbooks on cosmology. We physicists thought we knew it all. That the universe is made out of atoms. The old picture was that the universe is some kind of soap bubble. This is a picture given to us by Albert Einstein. And the soap bubble, well, it's expanding slowly, but it's slowing down. And we're like flies trapped on flypaper. We can't leave our soap bubble. That's the old picture. The WMAP satellite has forced us to throw out all this and introduce a whole new set of facts. First of all, the soap bubble is not slowing down. It is speeding up. It is out of control. It's expanding so rapidly that it could force a premature death of the universe. But this is the real killer now. This is what's causing so much excitement in the world of physics. We now believe there could be other soap bubbles out there in other universes. other universes that the old concept of a universe, a one universe, is being replaced by a multiverse and satellite data is leading the way. Now we could be on the cusp of a new Copernican revolution. Copernicus introduced the idea that the earth is not the center of all there is, that the sun was the center of the solar system. In this new Copernican revolution, our universe is not necessarily the only game in town. That there could be other soap bubbles. That soap bubbles can fission in half, like bud, sprout, baby soap bubbles. Baby universes. Baby new universes. Bits. That's right. And Stephen Hawking has even written about these baby universes. What would they be like if we met one of these baby universes? And speculation has now turned into hard fact, because in six years' time now, a new satellite is going up into orbit called LISA. Laser Interferometry Space Antenna, which could nail it to the wall. Lisa could give us, now get this, Lisa could give us baby pictures, baby pictures of the instant of creation itself. Now think about it, the baby universe emerging from the womb, that's what we hope to get out of Lisa. And some of us are betting, some of us physicists are putting money on the table. Believing that when we get these baby pictures of the instant of creation, that maybe there'll be an umbilical cord. An umbilical cord connecting our universe to a parent universe. Because we were a bubble off a previous universe. That's right. right. And maybe our universe has given birth to other baby universes. So another umbilical cord going another way. Mm, that's right. Uh, now, people already will be saying, thinking of this and thinking, well, this is, this is physics? This is surely not physics. Is it, you're first of all rewriting the English language. No longer universe doesn't mean everything, it just means part of everything. And then secondly, you're re rewriting how we think about God, theology, the re religion, what, what the whole purpose of life is. That's right. If you really think about the multiverse idea, it's staggering in its philosophical and theological scope. For example, when I was a child, uh, I used to go to Sunday school and learn in the Presbyterian Church all about the moment of Genesis. And it was such a thrilling story, this man saying, let there be light. But you know, my parents are Buddhists, and in Buddhism, there is no Genesis. There's Nirvana. Nirvana is timeless. There's no beginning, and there's no end. So for all these years, I had these two mutually exclusive ideas in my head. And how can I reconcile these? Well, now I'm a physicist at the cutting edge of something called string theory. We can talk about later. But now I realize that the multiverse idea is this wonderful blend, this melding of these two religious thinking, that Genesis, Genesis takes place continually, continually in an ocean of nirvana. That these bubbles are sprouting out of nirvana, and this nirvana is something we call 11-dimensional hyperspace. It is a much larger space that our soap bubble is expanding into. And so we have a, a beautiful melding of a timeless nirvana giving birth to multiple genesis. Well, I, we'll come on to some of the details in a moment. I just wondered, though, whether you, when you talked about it's like Copernicus saying that the Earth isn't the way we thought of, thought of it before and that, uh, that uh, the sun doesn't go around us, it's the other way around. And these religious examples, you sound like a heretic. 
and heretics get burned at the stake. We, we don't believe you. you can't, you're upsetting the natural order. Well, in 1600, Giordano Bruno, uh, a, former, a former Catholic priest, was burned alive by the Catholic Church for saying precisely these things. He talked about parallel worlds in outer space, other suns, and what could be more innocent than the idea of alien civilizations out there in the heavens? But think about it. If you do believe in these parallel worlds in space, the Church would say to itself, is there a Pope? Is a there a Trinity? Pope. Is there a parallel Christ? Is there a parallel saints? How many saints are there in outer space? How many popes? Which pope has religious uh, jurisdiction over any other pope? The mind goes crazy thinking about the religious implications of parallel worlds, so the church simply burned him alive. Okay, well, we're not going to do that, to, that today, but let, let me take you back then. So, this new model, this very, very exciting new model, which you believe you have the evidence for, of this universe expanding out of control much faster than we thought, why does that mean the end of us? Why does that mean it will all go dark and cold? Well, even 150 years ago, thinkers like Charles Darwin, or more recently Bertrand Russell, wrote about the fact that physics does seem to say that the universe will eventually run down. It rusts. We have the, what is called the second law of thermodynamics. Chaos takes over. Stars blink out. Stars get cold. The oceans will freeze over and we'll all die in a big freeze. And Charles Darwin wrote in his autobiography, what an unpleasant thought, that evolution, that, that we struggled to get out of the swamp, every layer we, we struggled with is all for naught. Why bother to wake up tomorrow morning? Why bother to get, go to work knowing that we're all going to freeze to death billions of years from now? Well, now we actually have an exit strategy. Uh, you mentioned George Bush. He has to ponder when is the situation cool enough in Iraq to exit troops. Well, we physicists believe that our universe is cooling down too rapidly, that it is out of control that we are in an accelerating runaway universe. You said the laws of physics have signed a death warrant for, for our universe. We are in some not. sense, uh, in some sense there seems to be a death warrant for our universe. And again, it'll be billions of years from now. But what a thought, knowing that all the achievements of humanity will eventually crumble when the universe itself begins a to gloomy, crumble. A gloomy, pessimistic thought. Well, when we physicists give talks, uh, we get asked very embarrassing questions. Like, for example, Professor, what happened before the Big Bang? Well, the answer to that is the multiverse. The other embarrassing question we get is, this is all very depressing, hearing that the stars will blink out, the universe will consist of black holes, the oceans will freeze, the night sky will be dark. There will be no stars to guide us at night. What a horrible thought. And my attitude is that the laws of physics do have an escape clause. An escape clause by which perhaps we may have to go through this umbilical cord to perhaps journey to another universe. Now, explain, because one of the most difficult concepts to grasp in, in your book is this question of parallel worlds, worlds and where they are, where these other dimensions are. Everybody knows something is wide and tall and, and understands the concept of time. But where, where is this parallel universe? They're actually in our living room. When I was a child growing up outside San Francisco, I used to look at the carp in the Japanese tea garden. I used to spend hours imagining what would it be like to live in two dimensions. A very shallow pond, fish could swim forward, backward, left, right, their eyes were to the side, but the concept of up, up, up into the third dimension, up into hyperspace made no sense to any fish. And I imagined a scientist there saying, bah, humbug. Anyone who talks about the world of up is talking science fiction. And then I imagine as a child grabbing this fish scientist, lifting the fish scientist into hyperspace where the fish scientist would see other ponds, other ponds, parallel ponds, beings moving without fins, beings breathing without water, that is us, a new law of physics. Now, H.G. Wells, in his novel, The Invisible Man, no one ever reads it carefully to find out how H.G. Wells envisioned invisibility. He envisioned it through the fourth dimension. If I have two parallel sheets of paper, like two ponds, I have us in one universe, but I have another one hovering, just hovering inches above our universe. Light goes underneath the invisible man, so he is invisible, but he could look down on us. So we think that anyone in a higher dimension could be visible to us via its gravity. Gravity does seep across universes. Ah, so by being visible according 
because of its gravity, there may be a way of proving that this theory is more than just a theory. That's right. And believe it or not, the Hubble Space Telescope over the last several years has been giving us maps of something called dark matter. Dark matter makes up most of the universe. It's not made out of atoms. Your chemistry teacher was wrong in saying that the universe is mainly made out you of atoms. You are going to get burned at the stake, I can <laughs> see. Like chemistry. Anyway, go on. These are the whole generations of textbooks have now had to be thrown out. The universe is not mainly made out of atoms. We are talking about dark matter. It's invisible. You cannot photograph dark matter. We know it's there because of its gravitational presence. The Hubble Space Telescope has indirectly given us maps, gorgeous maps of dark matter pervading the galaxy. Well, some of us believe that we are actually tracing out the outlines of the invisible man, invisible galaxies, invisible worlds hovering just above our universe. Invisible because light goes beneath it, but we feel the effects of its gravity which hops across the universe. Which can be, can be measured. But then, can be but, measured. But then, if that is true, at some point, some scientists somewhere will find a parallel universe, will they not? Uh, and, and they are searching for it. We, we think that, uh, first of all, you can detect a parallel universe in several ways. First of all, how does a parallel universe form? Everybody knows that when matter falls into a black hole, it disappears. But, you know, even children ask the question of their parents, gee, daddy, if all that matter falls into a black hole, where does it go? Which is a good question. <laughs> Some of us believe that it's blown out the other end, that it goes through the kitchen sink, but then it's blown out into a white hole. A white hole emits matter rather than swallowing it up. A white hole expands very rapidly to accommodate all this new matter flowing into it. And hey, doesn't that sound like the Big Bang? Doesn't that sound <laughs> like Genesis itself? Our universe could be a white hole. A white hole expanding rapidly with matter flowing into it, connected by an umbilical cord to perhaps a parent universe. Now, th th when it comes to these umbilical cords, explain then, as you say, if uh, our universe is expanding rapidly and out of control, it's going to end up cold and dark and miserable. Mm -hmm. We right. have a choice of dying mm -hmm. or what? Well, as uh, Woody Allen once said, eternity is an awful long time, especially toward the end. <laughs> well, toward the end, in my book, Parallel Worlds, toward the end of my book, I actually give a blueprint, a blueprint of what would it take to open up a looking glass. Now, remember that Alice in Wonderland was written by Lewis Carroll, an Oxford mathematician known as Charles Dodgson. He knew that universes could be glued together at the hip, like Siamese twins, and he called that the looking glass that allowed you to see into Wonderland. Now, we physicists think we could do it as follows, by boiling space. Now, when you boil water in a microwave oven, you know, you turn up the heat and water forms uh, bubbles inside the water. Well, if you boil space, if you heat space up to what is called the Planck temperature, the temperature of the Big Bang, bubbles form. These are bubbles in space itself, tears, rips in the fabric of space and time. They are looking glasses, looking glasses into these other worlds, connected by umbilical cords to our world. And so we realize that there could be an escape hatch. And for, for mankind, for everything that we know, not the depressing know. scenario you talked about that uh, Darwin painted and others that Bertrand Russell had painted, there may be a way out. There may be a way out that the laws of physics are not a death warrant, as Charles Darwin thought, as Bertrand Russell thought. We believe that perhaps we now have for the first time a loophole in the laws of physics that we may be able to boil space, open up these looking glasses, and perhaps in, in a civilization many years more advanced than ours, go and flee into a warmer, younger universe. This may be our only hope far into the distant future. Can you see, I want to talk a bit about the impact on, on humanity and ordinary people, but can you see why, to many people listening to this, it is almost as if theoretical physics has become a new priesthood? Because you can make the calculations, you speak this, uh, you're translating your technical language for the benefit of all of us and we have to take it on trust that you've got it right and this theory perhaps may be the right one. Well a priesthood is not accountable to anything but its own inner logic. We are accountable to the laws of nature. We have the WMAP satellite up in orbit right now 
forcing us to rewrite a whole generation of textbooks that said that there's only one universe, that there's only atoms that make up the visible universe. That's the old thing that's been replaced by the WMAP satellite. And in six years, as I mentioned, LISA goes up in orbit. And again, LISA could disprove this, the laser interferometry satellite. Three satellites connected by laser beams making a triangle. The triangle is three million miles across, making it the largest satellite system ever conceived of by the human mind to be launched in 2011. And it'll detect shock waves, shock waves from the instant of the Big Bang. And if the shock waves don't come out right, if the frequency of vibrations that Lisa picks up does not correspond to our theories, our theories go out the window. And however, you have to start again. <laughs> however, if they confirm it, oh. this could be the greatest revolution in philosophy since the Copernican Revolution. In uh, interesting, you use the word philosophy because, for example, one obvious uh, question which arises, which is, why should we behave well to each other? Why should individuals do good things if if it's all purposeless, if it's not benign, if we're going to end up, however we, as one uh, scientist, Richard Dawkins, put it, the universe that we observe has precisely the properties we should expect if there is at bottom no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference, which has a huge moral dimension to it. Why, why should we behave well? Well, look at the way Einstein looked at the question of divinity and morals and ethics. Einstein said there really are two types of God. Uh, one is the God of prayer, the God that you pray to, the God that parts the waters, the God of Isaac and Moses and Jacob, the personal God. The other God is the God of Spinoza, the God of design, the God of harmony. Einstein says something very profound. He said the universe could have been chaotic. The universe could have been random. The universe could have been ugly. And yet we have this gorgeous synthesis at the origin of the universe itself, giving birth to the galaxies, the planets, DNA, life. And Einstein said that the harmony he sees could not have been an accident. That we're not talking about the design of humans. We're not talking about an intervention that gave us eyes, and noses, and ears. But where did the laws of physics come from? I work in something called string theory, which has makes the statement that we are reading the mind of God. Uh, it is based on music, little vibrating strings giving us particles that we see in nature. The laws of chemistry that we struggled with in high school would be the melodies, the melodies you can play on these vibrating strings. The universe will be a symphony of these tiny vibrating strings. And then the mind of God that Einstein wrote about at length, the mind of God would be cosmic music music resonating through this nirvana, through this 11-dimensional hyperspace. That would be the mind of God. One of the basic, I suppose, principles of, uh, of the discussion that we're having and of your book is that if mankind is doomed in this universe and mankind has to find an escape strategy, then mankind's got to be a lot better and smarter than we are now. You talk about type one, type two, and type three civilizations. What do you, what do you mean by that? We physicists look in outer space and we catalog very advanced civilizations by type one, two, or three. Type one would be a planetary civilization that controls the oceans, controls the volcanoes and the weather. Type two controls stars. They play with stars. They eat up stars for breakfast. Type three is galactic. They roam the galactic space lanes. Now, by contrast, what are we? <laughs> well, nowhere near even type one, are we? <laughs> We're type <Minimal> zero. Failures. <laughs> we get our energy from dead plants. However, every time I read the newspaper, I see the birth pangs of type one. What is the internet? The internet is the beginning of a planetary telephone system. I see it right before my eyes, a type one communication system opening up. The language of type one will be English. It is already the universal language of elites. It will be the language of type one. And look at the economies, NAFTA, the European Union, trading blocks. The birth of a new economy is taking place. Now, there are people who don't like this transition, who in their gut, feel more comfortable being in a type minus one. <laughs> They're the terrorists. They, in their gut, realize that a type one has, civilization has free-flowing ideas, challenging orthodoxies, new, vigorous, wondrous ideas popping forth. That's type one. Do, do you think that, given that, that we're not even type one or type half, that mankind is going to destroy the world in our own 
way before we have anything like the problems that you're talking about to face? In other words, it's global warming or we'll kill each other with war that we should be worrying about, not this. That's a definite problem. When I look in outer space and we look for signals from alien life, we see nothing. It's quiet out there. But the laws of physics tell us there should be, it should be teeming with intelligent life forms. More intelligent than we are. Right. And one theory is that, yes, there were many type zeros out there, but the savagery, the savagery of their rise from the swamp, they kept with them all the sectarian fundamentalist racial nonsense of the forest and that's why they self-destructed before they attained type 1 status so the birth of type 1 we think is going to be quite convulsive it'll take place in the next hundred years the next hundred years are the most important hundred years in all of human history because it'll determine whether or not we make that transition to to type 1 civilization a planetary civilization or, or perish by our own rather brutal means that's right and when we go into outer space and see different star systems perhaps we will see planets whose atmospheres are too hot. They did have a greenhouse effect, or their atmospheres are radioactive. They did have a nuclear war. And perhaps that's why we don't see them with our telescopes and instruments. You're, you're a communicator and a scientist, and the two words quite often don't appear in the same, <laughs> in the same sentence, which I think Very you often. would accept. And also, you are a scientist who talks without any embarrassment whatsoever about God. Which is also unusual, isn't it? Well, we physicists are the only scientists who can say the word God and not blush. We are dealing with the cosmic questions of existence, of meaning. Uh, Thomas Huxley, the great uh, biologist of the last century, said that the question of all questions for science and religion is to determine our true place, our true role, our true place in the universe. For both science and for religion, it is the same question. However, there has been a divorce uh, in the last half century or so between science and humanists, and I think it's very sad that we don't speak the same language anymore. But you're changing that in a way, aren't you? We are I hope. But do you, just as we, as, we, as we wrap up this conversation, I wonder, you know, does this keep you awake at night? You have the same pressures as uh, the rest of us? Do you find it difficult to go from pondering, touching the face of God, to come down to the mundane realities of living in a rather dangerous and sometimes nasty world? Uh, yes, there's always that schism there, but when I go home at night and I take a shower and I really think about outer space and I think about where we are going, I mean, I cannot live in an ivory tower realizing that there really are threats to our advance to, to a type 1, that there are people who actively would want us to go back a thousand years into the past. And so, yes, I realize that this is that crucial time where it could tip either way. It could lead to a paradise, an Aquarius, age of Aquarius of a type 1 civilization, or the havoc of going back a thousand years to religious sectarian orthodoxy. Professor Michio Kaku, pleasure talking to you. Thank you right. very much. My pleasure.